Good morning, everybody from San Francisco. Um, today, we put together a group of our uh, orthopedic and neurosurgeons from our uh, UCSF spine service. We, we work uh, uh, very closely in collaboration. And uh, we're going to do four articles on the topic of proximal junctional kyphosis. And I'm going to start just with a brief overview of the topic. And then I'm going to give the, uh, the, the topic up to our, our moderators and our fellows presenting. Um, so just by way of a, of a brief overview. Let's see, do I, do I have control of the screen here? I was trying to advance that slide. You do. There's a couple slides after that that we need to show. So is it not moving forward? Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Try hitting your screen again, Dr. Bourbon. If you go it's, down to the left-hand corner, there you go. Okay. Terrific. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so in terms of our agenda today, I'm going to give just a brief overview on, on what the problem is, proximal junctional kyphosis and deformity. And then we've got uh, Kevo Hindian, one of our fellows, who's uh, next year going to be practicing down in the Pasadena area. And he's going to talk about an article of the cost and the impact of PJK. And my partner, Alecos Theologius, will be moderating that one. Next, uh, we'll have Michael Venezia talk about biomechanics and some dynamic considerations of PJK. Uh, presented a paper that won the ISSLs Award last year, and Shane Birch is going to help moderate that. Um, Andrew Lee next will talk about some techniques for PJK avoidance. We've got Vedette Devon on the line, and Vedette's going to talk about some of the work that he's done with ligament augmentation. And finally, uh, Aaron Clark from our neurosurgery uh, groups can talk about predictive modeling and some of the uh, um, models that might be useful to predict the incidence of PJK and recognizing risk factors may be useful also for prevention of PJK. So just as an overview here, um, <clears throat> junctional complications, be they proximal or distal, are, are awfully important and, and a major reason for revision surgery uh, in deformity. And focused on proximal junctional kyphosis, we see this most commonly at our thoracolumbar and, and our cervical thoracic junctions. And, and just uh, to illustrate the point here, this is what this may look like uh, with or without a vertebral augmentation. Um, at the thoracolumbar junction. In terms of the definition uh, that we use here, the Gladys definition of uh, more than 10 degrees of kyphosis above the, the proximal junctional angle compared to prior to surgery is what we're using. So if you take the UIV plus one compared to the uh, UIV, looking at the end plate above and below, a more than 10 degree change is uh, the definition of PJK radiographically. Uh, more severely, proximal junctional failure uh, tends to involve a fracture or some subluxation or neural symptoms. And, and Gladys uh, or uh, Hostin actually uh, gave a nice definition of that. The classification here from Wachiaji's group I think is useful is that there tend to be three types of failure, either ligamentous failure, a bony failure with a fracture, or some implant and bone interface failure. And uh, this classification offers both some insight into the mechanism as well as the severity of symptoms and finally, whether or not there's some spondylolisthesis. The spondylolisthesis can be associated with, uh, with neural impairment, quite importantly. So we've done quite a bit of work now with proximal junctional kyphosis and, and looking at etiology, the pathogenesis of the process. And, and uh, some of our work has suggested that choice of levels does make a difference. And we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, try to get to the first lordotic vertebra, uh, either at the um, a neutral or a lordotic vertebra, both proximally and distally is a strategy that that seems to be somewhat protective, recognizing that uh, we really shouldn't stop our constructs at a uh, um, uh, UIV where the adjacent segment is uh, kyphotic uh, preoperatively, so trying to get at least to a neutral or lordotic segment, looking somewhat at the biomechanics of fixation and also bone quality uh, tend to be factors that are important. Well, one of our publications on this looked at uh, patients, all of whom were fused to the pelvis, and certainly we recognize fusing to the pelvis is a real risk factor putting strain uh, on the adjacent segments compared to leaving mobility uh, at the lumbar sacral junction. These were patients on uh, average age almost 65 with two year follow up. We found that radiographically, so by the Gladys definition, fully 40% of patients had some evidence of junctional kyphosis, and 12% of patients actually required reoperation. When we looked into this in detail at some of the risk factors for reoperation, we found that when we got a, a large change in lumbar lordosis, be it with a PSO, or with, uh, with uh, multiple uh, posterior raised osteotomies, more than about 30 degrees of lordosis was associated with junctional problems. Patients who had a preoperative thoracic kyphosis, so these were all from the thoracolumbar ductus sacrum, and a subset of patients who really weren't able to get hypolordotic, 
or weren't able to comp compensate with the upper thoracic spine were predisposed to junctional kyphosis. A pre-operative proximal junctional angle of more than 10 degrees, meaning if you stopped at a UIV that was more than 10 degrees kyphotic preoperatively, that was a risk factor. And finally, patients with a high pelvic incidence. And of course, that spoke to the fact that these patients required more correction. We then looked at, well, what about from the thoracolumbar junction, what about can we do better by going to the upper thoracic spine? And is that protective? And this is a case of mine that developed translation between T3 and T4 after fusion to the upper thoracic spine. Unfortunately, this patient didn't have a neurologic injury, but this certainly can present with neurologic injury. And that was my revision of that case. So looking at, again, our experience from the UIV uh, uh, in the upper thoracic spine compared to the thoracolumbar junction, again, pretty similar rates of radiographic as well as revision surgery. The big difference we found was that um, the subset of patients who had a uh, thoracolumbar junctional kyphosis in the thoracolumbar area tended to be associated with a fracture compared to the upper thoracic spine, where it was much more likely to be a subluxation. So looking at, at the studies we've done, and I'm putting this all together, recently we've got a, um, uh, an abstract in, uh, at the SRS this year actually looking at Hounsfield units and bone density. Shane Birch does the work with bone strength and uh, risk of PJK. Obviously, fusion to the sacrum compared to leaving mobile segments. The choice of the UIV, and uh, another uh, paper that's accepted to the SRS this year is looking at the uh, relationship between our upper instrumented vertebra and the femoral heads. And when we get more than about 20 degrees behind our femoral heads, that seems to be actually a very strong risk factor for PJK. Uh, proximal fixation strategy, and Vedes can address that with one of his papers. Correcting lordosis uh, with or without a PASO, but getting more than 30 degrees of correction of lordosis is certainly a risk factor. And, and postoperative mismatch is a risk factor. So with that as a background, I'm going to uh, yield the floor now to one of our fellows, Kevo Hendian. Uh, Kevo comes to us from Southern California. He's going to be going back to Pasadena next year uh, for his practice. And Kevo is going to talk about uh, the economics and the cost of PJK. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bourbon. Um, so just like Dr. Bourbon mentioned, I'll be talking about one of the papers out of uh, UCSF on the economic impact of revision surgery for proximal and junctional failure after adult spinal deformity. This was a cost analysis of 57 operations in a 10-year experience here at UCSF. So as an introduction and background, the mainstay of adult spinal deformity operative intervention consists primarily of long posterior instrumented fusions from the thoracolumbar junction or the upper thoracic spine to the pelvis. With increased loads and in motion at the upper instrumented vertebra in these constructs, there's risk of PJK and PJF. Just to review the definitions, PJK is a postoperative proximal junctional sagittal cob angle of greater than or equal to 10 degrees between the lower end plate of the upper instrumented vertebra and the upper end plate of two superadjacent vertebra when compared to the preoperative state. Proximal junctional failure occurs within six months of the index operation and is due to either a vertebral body fracture, uh, fixation, failure, osteoligamentous or osteoligamentous disruption. The same radiographic parameters still apply as PJK. PJF is functionally debilitating, as we all know, if we've taken care of these patients, and it's potentially dangerous with the possibility of neurologic injury and frequently requires revision surgery. The purpose of this study is to evaluate the direct costs associated with revision surgery for PJF occurring after operation for adult spinal deformity. Moving on to methods, uh, this was a retrospective cohort study of adult spinal deformity patients undergoing thoracolumbar fusions from August 2003 to January 2013. Of the 501 patients with adult spinal deformity treated surgically, 382 met the inclusion criteria. These criteria were instrumentation from L2 or above to the pelvis for the index operation, and patients were required to have a minimum of six months of postoperative clinical and radiographic follow-up. Patients with an upper thoracic UIV from T1 to T6 were compared with the patients with a lower thoracic UIV, T9 to T12. Direct costs related to the perioperative management of the patients were recorded for index operations and for the reoperations for uh, PJF only. Indirect costs were excluded from the analysis. Moving on to table one, which looked at the patient demographics and operative details for the index surgeries uh, and looking at the leftmost column for all comers, uh, the paper found that there was $68,249 worth of cost uh, on average for these patients. And 220 of the 382 index operations were considered to be revision surgeries, meaning that they had prior uh, lumbar fusion or some sort of prior 
uh, spine surgery before they came to our institution. And then when you look at the columns next door uh, and looking at the upper thoracic UIV versus the lower thoracic UIV, you can see there's a significantly, uh, statistically significant difference in terms of cost for upper thoracic UIV constructs versus lower thoracic UIV constructs. In table two, this was an itemization of the direct cost for the index operation. And as you might expect, the upper thoracic UIV constructs in patients required increased implant cost due to the longer construct and additional hardware. And labs and various supplies were also uh, had increased costs in the upper thoracic UIV cohort. Moving on to table three, looking at the demographic and operative details of the revision operations for proximal junctional failure, there were a total of 51 patients that required uh, revision surgery for PJF and a total of 57 cases, meaning six patients required more than one revision surgery. And 21 of the 51 patients required a three column osteotomy. So this alludes to the complexity of treating these uh, revision PJF cases. The authors found that there was a $55,547, um, $55,000 cost on average uh, to treat these PJF revisions. And again, the upper thoracic UIV patients required a higher cost per patient as, a, as opposed to the lower thoracic UIV patients. In table four, this looks at the costs of the revision operations versus the index operations. You can see that of the 57 revision cases, it there was a total cost of approximately $3.2 million, which is substantial. But what's interesting is the line below, which shows that the costs of the revision surgeries were, were just under the cost of the index operations. So it's a substantial cost per patient that is required to treat these patients. The study is very thorough. It's well done, although it does have limitations. There are 25% of the eligible patients were excluded due to incomplete clinical or cost data. The authors couldn't account for the peri and intraoperative changes instituted at our center over a 10 year period. There's a possible lack of generalizability given the number of revision surgeries. Uh, might not be as complex cohort of cases in the community. Health related quality of life data was not captured and patients were only required to have a minimum follow up of six months. So the authors concluded that revision operations for PJF after long thoracolumbar fusions for adult spinal deformity are associated with an average direct cost of $55,547 per case. Revision costs for PJF are similar based on the index procedure's UIV level. Over a 10-year period at a large deformity center, revision surgery for PJF resulted in a total cost of $3.2 million for 57 cases. And the most important point is that this article highlights the importance of meticulous surgical technique and planning to prevent PJK and PJF. That's it. Uh, thank you, Kibo. Oh, Kevo. Um, this is Alekos Theologis, one of the orthopedic spine surgeons at uh, UCSF. And I uh, wanted to first thank the Seattle Science Foundation for this opportunity, um, as well as the, uh, it's a real honor to be able to present our, our work um, um, in this format. Um, and just as a summary, um, this is a paper that um, really takes a thousand foot overview of all um, uh, surgeries for adult spinal deformity at our institution over a very long uh, time frame. Surgeries were heterogeneous and done by about 10 spine surgeons. So it does capture a, a large breadth of, of pathology um, that you'd see in the academic center or the community center. And um, I think the take home points from this paper are that revision operations for PJK or PJF are expensive. They near the index operation costs, at least in direct costs. And those costs really come from three major factors. One is the, um, the implants. Um, we know that there's um, high density of implants used in these operations just because of the number of levels that are uh, instrumented and fused. Two is the length of stay um, that these patients have either in the ICU and uh, overall. And so um, I think the keys to this, as uh, Kevo pointed out, are A, one is prevention is key, but also to decrease the cost would be to decrease ICU stays, decrease um, hospital stays. And um, there are a variety of ways that um, that can be done, um, either through preoperative optimization of patients, um, prehab to try to optimize their fitness, 
as well as their medical conditions to minimize either uh, intraoperative or post immediate postoperative complications uh, and just improve their rehab in the hospital and, and moving forward. So with that, uh, I'd love to get um, the other people's thoughts on this and um, start, start a discussion. Terrific, Alexa. I think uh, this is a really, really important topic that uh, I think we all face in doing doing uh, deformity surgery. Recognizing that one of the major reasons for failures of deformities, when we think about revision surgery rates at uh, maybe upwards of thirty percent at, uh, at at two years, even uh, one of the major reasons is junctural problems, and, and of course, prevention of this is a big part of what the subsequent papers are going to be about. Um, you know, Alexa, in terms of um, <clears throat> The cost, of course, the uh, uh, finances is only part of the cost. And and uh, can you talk to us a little bit about, uh, I know the paper didn't include health quality, quality of life information, but since then, we've had quite a bit uh, of information about health quality, quality of life. So the actual impact of these complications on patient outcome. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. So uh, we know that there is a high uh, clinical impact of PJK um, and PJF in, in a, just because of needing a revision operation, but two, especially in the upper thoracic um, region where the failure mode is primarily or more commonly um, a, you know, a ligamentous, um, it can be translational, resulting in neurologic deficit. And um, obviously, if someone develops that, um, it can be devastating um, and have a huge impact on their quality of life. So, um, it uh, wasn't captured in this paper, but uh, there are other, uh, are other papers that uh, demonstrate that this does compromise um, um, quality of life. And just, just in the chat, there was a question about how is the cost determined. So in, in this paper, the cost was actually determined by direct cost to the hospital. So this wasn't billing data. Uh, we, we had access to the uh, direct cost. You want to comment on that at all, Alekos? Um, yeah, that, that's exactly right. And um, it's through an administrative database. Um, and uh, we broke it down into several factors, um, as you saw uh, in the tables. And um, those are just standard, um, about 10 categories that are, are that were assessed. But indirect costs, surgeon fees, et cetera, were not included just because of the uh, variability that comes uh, with that um, from institution to institution. Maybe one more question to you, This is Vincent Arlay in Philadelphia. He's asking, uh, what, what were your observations over the course of the time of this study? Uh, or this was back in 2013. How have things changed since then? That, that's a great question. Um, I would have to go back and look at the data. Um, we haven't analyzed um, specifically the costs of the revisions or even the, the incidence of um, revision for PJK. My impression, though, um, is that PJK and PJF are decreasing given, at least at our institution, given um, some of the preventative strategies that uh, will be talked about. Um, these include augmentation of the upper instrumented vertebrae, the UIV plus one. Um, we wrote a paper, uh, myself and Dr. Birch, demonstrating that this does decrease the risk of PJF, um, secondary to uh, fractures, um, and uh, the utilization of um, the posterior um, tension bands, so augmentation of the PLC with a variety of techniques. And one of the papers um, will get into that. Other studies from UCSF have demonstrated that that is a cost-effective strategy. Um, I know that there's some debate in the literature whether that is um, beneficial, but at least there are some papers that demonstrate that it, that it works. Um, With that, let, let's, let's go ahead and transition. Terrific job. The, the next paper is going to be presented by another one of our fellows, uh, Mike Fidicius from Florida. He's going to be heading back to, to Tampa at the end of his fellowship uh, for a practice uh, in the Tampa area. And he's going to talk about some work that was done uh, here at UCSF uh, using biomechanics. And this paper won the uh, Issels Award last year, uh, looking at dynamic sagittal balance and, uh, 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 um, uh, 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 and dynamic, dynamic alignment in spinal deformity patients. And Shane Burt will be moderating this. Thanks, Dr. Bourbon, and uh, thanks to the Seattle Science Foundation for this opportunity. Um, so uh, as Dr. Bourbon said, I'm going to be presenting an uh, article entitled Biomechanical Changes in Dynamic Sagittal Balance and Lower Limb Compensatory Strategies Following Realignment Surgery in Adult Spinal Deformity Patients by Bailey et al., uh, published in the European uh, Spine Journal uh, last year. 
As by means of introduction, as we all know, uh, measurements of sagittal parameters have historically been uh, completed in a, sa a static setting uh, using full-length spine films. And as we're all uh, uh, aware, the surgical correction of adult spinal deformity patients seeks to restore sagittal balance, uh, dating back to Jean Dubizet's uh, cone of economy, uh, <clears throat> and that this includes looking at both standing and dynamic motion and activities of daily living. So uh, by means of that, assessing for spinal alignment from static films does not consider the effects of postural control. And Bay et al. showed that, uh, that the effects of muscular fatigue can be significant and short walks can actually significantly reduce SVA looking at static films. Uh, so assessing postural stability during dynamic testing may allow for a better understanding of these compensatory mechanisms and the risk of post-procedure complications, namely proximal junctional kyphosis, which has a variable instance in the literature, as we know, quite high. So the routine clinical evaluation of dynamic sagittal balance can be quite impractical. Practical. It has a long setup time, high cost, and it needs space for a motion analysis lab, uh, which I've learned in San Francisco isn't cheap. Uh, the goal of uh, this study was to collect in-clinic motion analysis in the adult spinal deformity cohort of patients and to define a set of objective uh, metrics that can look at post-surgical outcomes and possibly predict the risk of uh, PJK in the future. By means of a quick background, the original study that was uh, um, uh, uh, published by the, one of the co-authors, Matthew, um, uh, was the uh, initial study that uh, defined and validated the metrics that we're going to be talking about here. It's a little bit beyond the scope, uh, scope of this talk today, but I've listed here for completeness. So for this, this study, it was a longitudinal cohort study collecting uh, in-clinic motion data from 15 adult spinal deformity patients as well as 10 healthy cohorts uh, during an un do, uh, completing an unassisted sit-to-stand uh, functional maneuver the average age is approximately 62 uh, years old and it's predominantly female in the uh, ASD patient population. Uh, the patients were asked to complete as many unassisted sit to stands as they could, with a maximum being nine. And an RGB depth camera tracked 3D joint positions and used a uh, patient specific rigid body model that was validated from the uh, prior study that was uh, used to create the metrics. Uh, also collected was radiographic SVA and patient reported outcomes, including ODIBAS back and EQ5Ds. Uh, table to my right is all the variable metrics that were uh, measured. We're going to focus on the peak SVA and the torque at the lower lumbar spine and hip and knee as they relate to kind of sagittal balance and uh, or kind of the, uh, the the largest finding. So the peak SVA uh, as defined as a peak sagittal distance between the hip and the, and the shoulder centers uh, uh, that was found on the uh, depth sensors. So this is a quick overview of the uh, of the kinematic model that was uh, used in the uh, initial paper, and this was uh, uh, used to find the raw estimates of the joint center position uh, to obtain kinematic, dynamic, and biomechanical metrics. So in the results, there was a. Uh, uh, in the 15 uh, adult spinal deformity patient group, there was uh, significant improvement in all patient reported outcomes, including ODI, VAS, and EQ5Ds, as well as a significant improvement in the radiographic SVA. Looking at the dynamic, dynamic sagittal uh, balance measurements <clears throat> that we described prior, there was significant change for, uh, for the majority of them, uh, especially including the peak SVA, as well as the uh, torque on the lumbar spine and the uh, hip and knee forces. Um, there were a few variables, including center of pressure and vertical and horizontal momentum that did not significantly change. So focusing on the peak SVA and the hip-knee torque ratio, uh, as you can see from these uh, uh, charts, that there was a significant decrease between preoperative and postoperative uh, time points. Peak SVA had a 20% lower uh, uh, incidence than uh, uh, measurement than uh, from pre surgical to post surgical, and the uh, hip and knee torque ratio had a 19% de uh, decrease uh, to post surgical. Both of these metrics also had a significantly higher pre surgical uh, findings uh, compared to the control group. And then when they uh, reanalyzed the post surgical group, it was uh, relatively equivalent to the control group. So this data, uh, it highlights uh, new biomechanical measures of dynamic sagittal balance along with uh, lower limb compensatory strategies that are altered with reconstructive spine surgery. Um, so we, uh, reducing the peak SVA along with the force in the lower lumbar spine and altered contributions from the hip and knee uh, are, are beneficial in correcting our adult spinal deformity patients. And as we all know, a malaligned spine will initiate mechanically ineffective compensatory measures uh, that are measured by these uh, uh, lower limb uh, metrics, and that will alter the position of the center of pressure between their feet. Uh, these patients tend to employ what's known as a, a quasi-static uh, uh, leaning, which is where the patient can le leans as far forward as possible to move their torso directly above their feet before engaging their hips and knees to rise. 
Uh, and uh, these studies suggest that patients become less reliant on this strategy with uh, adequate correction of their uh, adult spinal deformity. So uh, a good study overall, there were some weaknesses, obviously a small sample size uh, with only 15 patients and 10 patients in the cohort. The spine motion, uh, when you look at the initial uh, uh, paper by Matthews was all looked at as one segment, so they weren't able to tease out thoracic versus lumbar motion. And the control group was a group that was being evaluated in clinic for presumably low back or uh, mid back problems and not completely asymptomatic. Um, as well as some of the biomechanical modeling did result into some uh, data and units of measure being difficult to understand and interpret based on these mathematical equations, at least for me. Uh, strength of the study, though, it was a standardized technique from data collection at a single surgeon. Um, it was uh, there was a use of well-validated uh, metrics that were published, and all these measurements were able to be completed in uh, in clinic visit. And I think some of the take-home points the authors wanted to get across were that peak SVA as a, as, a me, as a measure of sagittal balance, along with the loads on the lower lumbar spine, as well as the hip and knee, uh, in the sit to uh, in the sit to stand test uh, after dynamic motion, improved significantly post-operatively, and that uh, biomechanical contributions from the hip and knee change following surgery were uh, indicating that there was a, redu a reduction in the compensatory measures uh, in the lower limb, and uh, we, uh, inadequate improvement of these bio of this biomechanical stability may indicate an increased risk for post-junctional kyphosis, but uh, that remains to be seen. Thanks, Mike. Uh, this is Shane Birch. Um, I just want to say uh, thanks to SIG for uh, putting this together and also for the uh, uh, Saddle Science Foundation for supporting this. Um, Mike, you did a great job at summarizing the paper. So just a mile-high view on this. Um, I think that, you know, when we think of patients with deformity, um, you know, ultimately we're trying to make them better. We're trying to improve their quality of life. And when you go back and look at the original papers um, that uh, Glassman wrote and even uh, Schwab wrote, the, the uh, R-squared values um, in those papers were, were moderate to poor in terms of uh, quality of life. So we have to look at other things um, in our assessment of patients that really match patients' quality of life uh, and quality of life scores. And so we're kind of dipping our toe here into the sensor um, wave that's coming, and it's not going to go away. So the, the sensor wave meaning, like, how can we objectively measure somebody's function in clinic? So right now, we measure patients by just standing x-rays. But as we all know, that we don't spend our lives just standing. Um, we sit uh, we bend over, try and touch our, 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 our touch the ground, tie our shoes. And so when we fuse somebody, for example, um, we make it very difficult for them to, to do things like that. So we're kind of combining a few things here. We're trying to measure, um, you know, how somebody can sit to stand, how, how can somebody get, uh, get out of a chair, and then um, how does that uh, activity um, how can we measure that activity with uh, objective measures rather than just asking the question? So that's what this paper is, is kind of um, trying to do. And it's in a sense, it's a validation of a very simple technique. It's the Kinect camera. So it's a Microsoft uh, Kinect camera. There's no spheres that have to be placed on patients. And so it can be, the data can be captured very, very easily. The one downside of the um, of this, though, is that the, the post-processing is quite laborious. So it has to go through MATLAB right now, and it, it can take quite a bit of time to actually get the, uh, the measurements that Mike, um, Mike was talking about. So <clears throat> I just wanted to kind of give an overview of, of the, the concept of why we kind of w went down this path, why we're trying to do this, and, um, and you know, view this paper almost as a, as a validation of a testing algorithm uh, for these patients. And there's obviously some limitations to the, uh, to the paper, but at the same time, we can get some meaningful information out of it, uh, some of which is the peak SVA. So how forward does somebody go when they try to get out of a chair? And you can think of, uh, just from a biomechanics perspective, you know, if somebody's leaning way forward or rocking forward, they can put a lot of uh, stress and force on their proximal junctional um, or their, their, their proximal, or sorry, upper instrumented vertebrae, and it may uh, lead to, you know, proximal junctional um, uh, failure. So those are the concepts that um, I thought we should uh, introduce, and happy to, um, you know, open up the floor for any comments or discussion. Shane Sig, this is Izzy Lieberman. Uh, 
Great work. I, I really, really am excited that you guys are getting involved in this. Uh, at TBI, we've also embarked on this uh, dynamic analysis. Uh, one of the things that I would really like to see come out of the dynamic analysis and would like to hear your comments on is knowing we fuse the spine, is the dynamic analysis going to allow us as surgeons to decide which levels to fuse or take it even one step further? Should we fuse some levels and should we provide function at other levels with some kind of function preserving implants. So that's where I see this science going. And it is fascinating, as you pointed out, the volume of information that we're collecting on these patients is just tremendous. And sorting through or sifting through the volume of information to find out what's truly important is gonna be the challenge. Yeah, uh, Izzy, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, when we talk to somebody about doing a deformity case, we say, hey, I'm going to make your standing um, alignment great, but I'm going to take things away from you. You know, you're not going to be able to bend over and tie your shoes. And so that, that's something that we, we don't have a great understanding of what we take away from the patient when we give the patient good alignment. And obviously, we're optimizing the patient for perfect, you know, alignment in the standing position. And that's where a lot of our, our, our focus has been. And so with these um, new objective measures, I think we can, we can do what you just you know, stated. We can look at what we're taking away and, and try, to, try to mediate what we should and shouldn't do in terms of um, optimizing the patient's function. Shane, one of the comments from uh, uh, Vincent Arlay suggested that Bawachi did some work uh, 10, 15 years ago showing a patient with worse sagittal balance at a slower gait and shorter uh, stride length. I know Izzy, a lot of your work has involved uh, gait uh, analysis as well. What, what are your thoughts, Shane, with the motion analysis? Do you think we can transition to this to, this to some gait analysis as well? Yeah, I think the, the challenge that, that uh, we have with gait analysis is the, um, it's just the space. So you need dedicated um, you know, uh, clinic space for that or lab space. And one of the advantages of this is that we, we haven't really asked um, for you know, too much of an investment in terms of a footprint. So I think gait analysis is fantastic. Izzy obviously has a, a, a lab um, and can probably speak to it more than I can, but you know, we've tried to, um, to uh, put these uh, objective measures in the clinic and make it kind of turnkey in the clinic so that you don't have to see the patient, then you know, send the patient to a lab and then get the results. We're trying to get the, the results real time as we assess the patient. I, uh, I really, really like the fact that you guys are using some of the more updated technology. Uh, there's no doubt that we have a lot of technology in the palm of our hands that can give us this data. And that, I think, is also the future. And you're absolutely right. Getting it in the clinic uh, is going to be a big step forward in gathering the information and analyzing what's the correct information. Terrific. Well, let's go ahead and transition now. And um, we've got our, our, our next papers to be presented by Andrew Lee. Andrew Lee came to us from New York. He's going to be staying here in the California area after fellowship. And uh, Andrew Lee is going to present some of the work that's been done with uh, ligament augmentation. And my part of it, Ed is going to be the moderator on this. So go ahead, Andrew. Uh, Andrew, you're, you're muted. Yeah, you got to turn off your mute. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Byrne. So ligament augmentation uh, for prevention of proximal junctional kyphosis and proximal junctional failure in adult spinal deformity. And we present the article published in 2018 in Journal Neurosurgery of Spine. Uh, just some background. Proximal PJK is a well-recognized complication of adult spinal deformity. There's no standardized definition. However, studies do describe PJK as an increase in proximal junctional angle greater than 10 to 20 degrees. This condition presents with abnormal kyphosis above the UIV. And this angle of kyphosis measured uses the sagittal cob angle between the inferior end plate of the UIV and the superior end plate of the second vertebral body above the UIV. Radiographic definitions of PJK require kyphosis greater than 10 to 20 degrees compared with preoperative baseline. The causes of PJK are not understood and can be related to a multitude of factors, whether it's age related to generation and deformity, disruption of the posterior ligamentous complex, vertebral fractures, instrumentation failure, degenerative disc disease, 
or facet violation. And we know that most cases of PJK occur early in the post-operative course, roughly 66% observed in the first three months and 80% within the first 18 months. Ligament augmentation is a novel technique for PJK prevention that provides additional strength between the UIV and the UIV plus one. This ligament suture is flexible, but may provide structural support and an element of lordotic tension. It is composed of PET. Straightforward, safe, it does not significantly increase operative time, and it may be a valuable adjunct for PJK prevention in adult spinal deformity. For our methods, we evaluate 200 adult spinal deformity patients, 100 before ligament augmentation, 100 after lig ligament augmentation from 2010 to 2015. Patient demographics were collected regarding age, sex, indication of surgery, number of levels fused, use of vertebral plasty, hook fixation at the UIV, or three-calm osteotomy. PJA was measured preoperatively and at last follow-up on a 36-inch radiograph, as well as spinal pelvic parameters were measured on pre-op and post-op radiographs. Neuromuscular or neurodegenerative disorders in less than six months of follow-up data were excluded. Just to present the technique itself, uh, ligament augmentation, using a matchstick burr, holes are drilled through the spinous processes of the UIV, and the levels immediately above and below. A sub cable is then passed through each level in a stepwise fashion. As the sub cable is passed, and then it is pulled to one side. This is then repeated with a second cable on the opposite side in a similar fashion. The cable is then pulled down to obtain the desired amount of tension as shown. And the cables are then locked onto the rod using supplied titanium connectors. Spinous processes are then loaded in slight extension to resist flexion at the terminal construct. Uh, for our results, the mean age was 66 for the ligament augmentation cohort patient. 67% uh, were, were female. Uh, the indications for surgery were scoliosis, sagittal imbalance, and flat back mostly. And of note, 51% were revision surgery. 38% did incorporate an anterior lateral approach, and the majority of the UIV were in the upper thoracic or the lower thoracic spine. Hook fixation and vertebral plasty were also performed. The change in the PJA and the ligament augmentation cohort was known to be eight, roughly 84%, and the mean change in the angle was six degrees. There are nine compression fractures at the UIV, which is sit similar to the pre-ligament augmentation cohort, and there are 19 reoperations. So noted when comparing the pre-ligament to the ligament augmentation cohort, the ligament cohort was slightly older. There are no differences in sex, indications, rate of revision, three column osteotomies. However, the ligament augmentation had a higher number of levels fused, higher rates of constructs with the UIV in the upper thoracic spine, similar rates of constructs terminating the lower thoracic spine, and lower rates of constructs in the lumbar spine. Higher rates of hook fixation at the UIV was associated with constructs terminating in the upper thoracic spine, and there were no significant differences in the spinal pelvic parameters. Once linear regression analysis was performed for a change in PJA and binary logistic regression for PJF, the variables we know that were significant, significantly associated with the change in PJA included age, use of hook fixation at the UIV, and ligament augmentation. The only variable significantly associated with PJF was the use of ligament augmentation. As a result, PJK prevention strategies have evolved over our recent times due to its increasing prevalence. Hook fixation at the UIV and the upper thoracic spine to address soft tissue fatigue, vertebroplasty for the lower thoracic spine to address compression fractures and terminal contouring of rods in situ. Analysis shows that age, hook fixation, and ligament augmentation were associated with the change in PJA, but only ligament augmentation was associated with lower rates of PJF. Revision surgery for PJK and PJF have significant economic impacts, and the ligament augmentation cohort had higher proportion of ancillary techniques for PJK prevention. To control for these differences, multivariate analysis was used, which showed strong association between ligament augmentation reduction changes in PJA and PJF. The mean change of six degrees in PJA and ligament augmentation represented dramatic improvement compared to reported literature and historical controls. Some limitations include modest follow-up and a retrospective design and heterogeneity and cohort indications of surgery. In conclusion, there's a dramatic reduction in PJK and PJF associated with ligament augmentation in adult patients when compared with historical controls undergoing spinal deformity. Ligament augmentation was associated with a significant reduction in PJF 
However, these results provide a rationale for implementation of ligament augmentation, but there's a need for standardized metrics for PJK and PJF reporting. Thank you. Okay, Vedette, I'm gonna ask you to un unmute yourself there and, and Vedette's gonna moderate. You gotta, you gotta un hit the unmute button. Do you guys hear me now? Do you You're hear on. Me? You're right. on now, yes. So, <laughs> thank you for Seattle Foundation to, you know, help us to put this together. Uh, but my particular, you know, appreciation is to the same. He had a lot of... Muted. Hey, hey Bennett, you're, you're muted again. You're back on. All right, so um, I'm not sure if you guys hear me. SIG did a lot of arm twisting to get us up early to participate to the course. Thank you to the SIG. Uh, <laughs> it was a difficult job for him. Uh, but uh, um, is, I just want to appreciate also and recognize that my partner, Dr. Christopher Ames, these patients are actually a combined cases that uh, technique develop over time that, you know, doing high volume of deforming the surgeries. Um, I just want to mention that this is just the, one of the preventive technique of the surgeries that you need to use to prevent the um, PJK and PJF especially. Uh, you cannot, you know, ignore the fact that, you know, bone quality, importance of vertebroplasty, you know, soft landing back using hooks. And not just the surgical technique, post-operatively, you know, you need to make sure that you control the junction with the braces for a while. Um, these are really, really important measures to prevent the PJK because the PJK is not just the, you know, one factor affecting the, you know, um, mechanism because what we are doing with the ligament repair is the, you know, just focusing on the tension and the ligaments because there are other factors also affecting the PJK. Uh, uh, one thing that, you know, this is an additional procedure. It adds additional time and cost to the surgery, uh, but you can see that the, you know, Expensive PJK revision surgery is, I think, saving, you know, uh, quite a bit number of patients is important to decrease the overall cost of the deformity surgeries. Um, you can see, you know, I'm not going to specifically talk about the technique. You can find on the article, and then there are some videos also available, I believe, that you can watch how it's been performed. Uh, and we just looked at the, it's unpublished, we just looked at the recent results, and we have now almost 300 patients with one-year follow-up. Um, numbers are looking quite impressive. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I had a couple of questions from the panel, um, uh, from the chat. So one of the questions is, what do you think about the current materials? So what, what are you using for this now? And uh, what do you think about the materials and, and limitations of materials that might be used for ligament augmentation? So the, um, Currently, these are all the, you know, subluminal tapes that are available. These are, you know, different forms of polyethylene tapes. Um, and the design to use instead of uh, subluminal wires. Um, so I just want to mention that this technique and using these implants are, are completely off-label. Uh, there's no, you know, uh, indications of using any sort of implants at this point that is on-label. But I think we need to recognize that and work through that, you know, these techniques are, you know, required to be, you know, approved and, you know, in, important to treat these patients. So uh, in terms of material, currently these are just the, you know, the polyethylene tapes. Um, you can also use, you know, I think cables might be also used. But also there is a, remember, there's significant forces that you need to protect the spinous processes. The more stronger material that you use, it might cut through the spinous processes and may cause spinous process fractures, and then your tension will fail again. But then how do you choose how many levels to do, and um, wh which patients do you choose to do this on, uh, Terrence Kim? So over time, uh, when we start, first we start using the cement, you know, like the Shane published a quite a bit impressive data uh, to prevent the fractures. But the PJK incidence didn't significantly, like, I mean, still significantly high. Then we start using the, you know, like everybody else, we were wrapping, you know, Merceline tape around the spinous processes, UEI and UEI plus one, UIV plus one. Uh, but that also wasn't strong enough. 
it was this is all on its own unfortunately because of it is off, off label it procedure we can't do biomechanical studies and secure funding um uh then we start using these techniques going through the spinous process which is the key is going through the spinous process because uh you need to anchor through the bone and you need to anchor multiple spinous processes not just the one about to improve the you know tension but enough that prevent the pjk or pjf uh, those are like really critical critical steps that we observe that is important that the technique to work um so in terms of indication all long fusions about lumbar spine uh thoracic lumbar upper thoracic the upper thoracic technique might be a little bit different because of the size of the spinous processes uh you may end up you know crossing through two spinous processes instead of three um and the um one other oh we also have not improved the technique so um we historically we were not um doing fusion at that level so the soft landing is important now without disrupting the joint we are decorticating the lamina uh at the uiv plus one and doing inside the fusion from uiv plus one to the you know uiv to kind of have the more soft landing in addition to tension map Maybe one final question, just so I could open up this up to the uh, uh, to the participants here, is how many people uh, doing long constructs are using uh, tethering? This is a question from Matthew uh, Goodwin, and I wonder if people can either raise their hands or unmute themselves and just share uh, maybe uh, uh, Jens and Rod up there in Seattle and uh, guys at TBI. Uh, Izzy, who else is using uh, some type of a tether in their constructs? So for, I can answer that question first before people can answer. So uh, we've been doing this technique almost five years, uh, and uh, every patient with long construct gets the tension band repair unless the spine process is absent. Sig, thanks for the uh, opportunity. Vidat and uh, Andrew, nice uh, presentation, nice paper. The, I, I've got a couple comments and questions. I have not jumped on the tether bandwagon as it is. I did uh, start with hooks proximally. I do very often augment the upper instrumented vertebrae plus one. Um, and I've been doing that for, for many years uh, following Shane's uh, work and some work that we did with John Costwick in Toronto uh, before I even got to, uh, to Texas back. But uh, one of the questions about the paper, uh, you mentioned that the two groups, um, the ones before you start instrumenting, were less levels instrumented. So I'm presuming that meant less uh, in the thoracic spine. So these were uh, maybe T9, T10 versus T5, T6 ends. So do you still think that it's an accurate analysis if you're looking at where the level stopped and trying to justify the use of these tethers. And then the second comment, and, and this is more philosophical, I've just always had an issue with adding dissection to the soft tissue, removing the natural posterior tether to add some kind of functional tether. And then with that, I, I, was, I was very interested in your comments saying that you are now decorticating the lamina above at your soft tether and doing an in situ fusion, but it's probably not really fusing. You're, you're generating maybe a, a pseudarthrosis site. And, and for years, we've tried to stay away from pseudarthrosis. And a lot of us justify our existence by operating on previous pseudarthroses. So that's where I would come from on these, these uh, issues. So the quick comment on the um, inside the fusion, um, you might be right that you may we may not getting the strong fusion at the level of the junction, but I believe that the R construct is significantly rigid enough. What we are observing now, instead of the PJK or PJF, every time that when you are steering to standing, you know, it, just experiment yourself that you have to lean forward. You have to lean. There are a lot of functional, daily functional activities that we lean forward. So you, we always put stress on that junction and the top of the screws. So with these techniques, we realize that we are preventing the 
PJK and PJF. But now the most of the stress is concentrated on the screws. There is more screw lucency despite the patients are fused on these patients. So we are seeing a little bit more direction to change to the fixation lucencies instead of PJK and PJF. You're right, we are trying to prevent certain things and sometimes you create other things by doing other procedures. Um, and the, similarly, I think your concern about the pseudoarthrosis is important. Uh, but there was a paper that SIG actually published a long time ago. The thoracic pseudoarthrosis is actually more tolerable to the patients than the lumbar thoracic, lumbar pseudoarthrosis. Um, I'm not sure if SIG remember that paper. We did it together like, you know, a long time ago when I was a fellow. I think SIG was the junior attending. Um, so uh, one of the other techniques, like you mentioned, like not to disrupt the tension band, not performing additional exposures. Uh, the perk screws could be important, you know, can be helpful to prevent that. Uh, but again, the problem, again, that you like to mention that the, are we creating, you know, pseudoarthrosis by using the percutaneous screws at the top of the, you know, um, construct. Okay, so, so several more questions uh, to, uh, to to go on that. We've got room for uh, room, room for further studies. So thanks for that. that that's terrific and, and really great work that you're doing on that. Let's transition now to our last paper. We've got Eric Clark uh, from our neurosurgery group, and he's going to talk about predictive modeling and PJK. Thanks, Aaron. Well, thank you, Sig, for, uh, for the invitation, and also special thanks to the Seattle Science Foundation for setting up such a wonderful program. Um, Moving on to, um, see, to the to the bulk of my talk. Um, actually, having a little bit of trouble advancing here. There we go. Uh, so the paper I'll be discussing um, is a paper from the ISSG. Um, and by way of background, um, a lot of this has been covered already, um, but I did want to highlight a significant difference um, in this paper's uh, definition to make the outcome measures slightly more relevant to um, treating patients. Um, and in addition to the standard definition of PJK, which has been mentioned before, they define what they call clinically significant PJK, which is uh, a worse uh, kyphotic angle at the at the um, at the junctional level, 20 degrees, as well as worsening by one SRS Schwab sagittal modifier grade um, in the postoperative period. And, and this table on the right uh, demonstrates the definition of the SRS Schwab um, grading system. Um, proximal junctional failure was defined as both PJK plus the need for a revision surgery during the postoperative period. And um, just uh, as additional background, um, this is a, a manuscript that I was involved in highlighting the causes of PJK, which is progressive deformity at the junctional level, disruption of the PLC, a fracture at that level, instrumentation failure, or progressive degenerative disc disease or facet violation during the, the index surgery. This happens um, in about 5 to 46 percent of adult spinal deformity surgery. And as was mentioned earlier, the majority of it happens within three months, and, and almost all of it happens within about a year and a half after surgery, and it's definitely associated with increased pain and disability when this happens. Moving on, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the ISSG database and the power of it, particularly when thinking about big data. And there are uh, several large data sets, particularly in the national, um, national medical databases, uh, but the ISSG does have some advantages, whereas um, it's much more granular. Um, it does have a very large patient sample. Uh, now it's up to above 2,700 patients. Um, and specifically, it focuses just on um, adult spinal deformity patients, which is definitely relevant to a topic such as this one. The goal of this study was importantly to create a preoperative predictive model, which is based on baseline patient demographics, radiographic measures, and surgical factors, 
which they, they use to predict proximal junctional failure or clinically significant PJK within two years following the index surgery. And the inclusion criteria are adult patients with scoliosis, um, abnormal spinal pelvic and sagittal metrics, as well as a surgical plan that included at least three, uh, at least four levels fused and a minimum of two year follow up. Neuromuscular patients were excluded as well as active infection or active malignancy. This study was retrospective and it involved a combination of three databases, one of which was prospective uh, and two of which were retrospective, one three column osteotomy database and an adult spinal deformity database. The data that was collected was based on patient age, their gender, body mass index, whether the operation was a primary or a revision operation, and the surgical details, whether it included a three column osteotomy, what the upper instrumented vertebra was, what type of instrumentation was used at the upper instrumented vertebra, the lower instrumented vertebra, the total number of levels fused. And this, the ultimate goal, like I mentioned in the beginning, was to generate a preoperative predictive model. And in this, in this case, they used the surgical details as a surrogate for the surgical plan that was created in the clinic. There were radiographic parameters included as well, including um, all our standard measurements at six weeks, three months, one year, and two years postoperatively, including PILL mismatch, pelvic tilt, SVA, and the thoracic kyphosis, as well as the Schwab SRS modifiers. And the outcome was grouped by PJK or PJF, or no PJK or no PJF. The model was created using the 13 available variables through, that were common through all three databases. And it was created um, it, using a computer program, a C5.0 algorithm, which created decision trees. And they actually used five different, um, different decision trees that were bootstrapped to use um, new data for each, for each pass through the model. And the final prediction was based on a combination of all five of these models. This is a screenshot that was shared by um, Chris Ames and Justin Shear as an example of, um, of the data progressing to their ultimate model. And this model was importantly internally validated. They generated a 70-30 split of the data where 70% of the data was used for training and then 30% was used for testing each model. And once, once created, the overall accuracy in the area under the uh, under the curve was calculated to see how well it performed. But first looking at, the, at some of the metrics and in, in its relationship to PJK and PJF, what they showed was that um, this was a sample of 510 patients of which 139 developed PJK or PJF. And that's about, that's a 27.3% rate, um, which is consistent with other published reports. PJK patients were older in age, and they also tended to have a higher body mass index. There's actually more patients in the PJK and PJF that had no coronal deformity and a pure sagittal plane problem. And when you look at the sagittal modifiers, there are more patients in the plus and plus plus groups that develop PJK or PJF. More PJK or PJF patients were fused to the um, TL to the thoracolumbar region, and more screws were used at the UIV compared to hooks. And lastly, more were fused to the um, sacroiliac region. There are higher um, rates of pelvic retroversion in the PJK and PJF group. More PILL mismatch, and also worse sagittal imbalance. Now, overall, the model performed very, very well with an accuracy of 86.3% prediction of PJK or PJF um, with a very high area under the curve, 0.89. And these were the 13 variables that were included in ranking of importance. Now, when applied to specific cases which were described in the paper, this is a 58-year-old female who has um, both a coronal and a sagittal plane problem. Um, underwent this fusion and did not develop PJK or PJF. 
in the, based on the model, the things that were working in her favor, she was young, hooks were placed at the UIV, the UIV was in the thoracic area, and the patient was not fused to the sacroiliac region. A second case is 66-year-old female with a flat back fused who did develop PJK at the UIV. And the things that may have predicted this, she's an older patient, screws are placed at the UIV. She was, uh, the UIV was T in the T1 to L2 area and she was fused to the pelvis. And so overall, this paper, the model is accurate, is internally validated, and the goal being that it, was, it will be applied preoperatively, although it was the surgical details that were included, and it accurately predicts PJK or PJF over the first two years after surgery. The interesting thing comparing predictive modeling to more traditional st statistics is predictive modeling can identify patterns, it can predict outcomes, but it doesn't use a traditional hypothesis-based testing. There are no controls used, and it uses all available data, not specifically data applying to a hypothesis. And multiple models can be used or, or combined to generate the model. Compared to traditional statistics with test hypothesis, it requires controls, a specific test must be selected, and you can discuss d differences that are significant but not necessarily clinically re relevant, particularly when you get into very, very large numbers. And it does deal with averages, so it's not necessarily specific to each individual patient. So the strength of this model, um, it used decision trees. It was actually a combination of five different models, and it used uh, internal validation and bootstrapping the data set, it's large, it's multi-institutional, and it has very, very long follow-up. The limitations, um, however, it is retrospective. There are only 13 variables included, and that could certainly be increased. And it was a slightly heterogeneous outcome in that it combined PJK and PJF. Um, the outcome was radiographic. It um, didn't discuss quality of life. And as you get into these ensemble computer models, you do lose a loss of model transparency to see exactly what the computer is doing. But overall, this is, I think, a fantastic proof of concept that predictive modeling can be used to predict outcomes in proximal, I mean, in um, adult spinal deformity patients. It's actually the first of its kind. It's the first predictive modeling um, manuscript ever written for adult spinal deformity. Um, I think in the future, it can be applied to a prospective data set. It can include a purely preoperative plan, and additional variables can be added, as well as just focusing on a solitary variable rather than a combination. But overall, I think this is a great paper. I definitely give it a thumbs up, and I'd be happy to um, answer any questions. And terrific presentation, really important topic. We're a little bit over, but I do think this is such an important topic. Maybe a couple questions. You know, one I'll start with, Aaron, is, is uh, so what, what's missing in terms of the model, and, and specifically uh, osteoporosis, bone strength, uh, what are the most important variables that are missing that we need to add? Well, I think that, that that's critical. Um, the uh, the uh, bone density data was not available in all three data sets, and it's not it's why it was not included. Um, but I think that, that that is probably one of the most important um, important things that, that could be included in future models. And I, and I think that you bring up a great point, and one of the strengths of this is that more, more variables can be added, and the model can continue getting better and better as you add more and more, um, more, and more variables to the model. Sig, Jack Ziegler. Um, practically speaking, what do you think the, the improvement uh, ratio is, percentage is going to be with education? So is there, can we get PJK, PJF uh, down to zero with educating people? Is it valuable to look at surgeons' experience and their rates of failure? Um, you know, can we educate enough people so that we don't have to look at 30% uh, failure rates anymore? Uh, well, Dr. Ziegler, I think, I think that's a great point. I, I think that, um, you know, certainly um, a, a couple answers to that question. I think one is uh, one of the strengths of the predictive modeling is that um, it, can, um, it, it can actually inform the surgeon preoperatively where this, patient, this specific, specific patient may be at very, very high risk of PJK 
and um, and additional strategies can be um, can be utilized to to try to prevent that, um, as well as the the ability to set benchmarks um, to where each individual surgeon, um, you know, in their specific population. Um, can look at their their own particular rates of PJK and PJF relative to what the model would predict. I'd like to wrap this up by, by thanking everybody for uh, for sharing their mornings with us. Uh, Jack and Rick, Izzy, the guys at TBI, the, uh, our host from Seattle Spines Foundation. Thanks for helping us set this up. We've really enjoyed the program so far. We're honored to be able to contribute and uh, look forward to participating again uh, next week. Okay, thank you, thank you, Sagan, everybody. Great job. Have a good weekend, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ruby. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.